and you know you're going to use your mouse. Okay, gotcha. Hey, uh, hello. So my presentation is on foxglove poisoning in dogs. Uh, the genus name for foxgloves is Digitalis. Uh, the specific uh, species we're going to be looking at is Digitalis uh, perpia, uh, which is the purple variety of foxglove, uh, although it comes in white and various other colors. Uh, so foxglove is an ornamental plant. Uh, it's native. Uh, it's native to the United States. It's pretty much pervasive. Uh, I'm from New Jersey. You will find it everywhere. You can find it in Indiana as well. I was actually planning on bringing some in today, but they're out of season. Uh, it's called digitalis because one of the ways that you can recognize foxgloves, uh, similar to the name, is that the actual structure of the plant looks like fingers itself, digits, and that's where the name comes from. And it can come in colors from pink, purple, and white. You really just need to know the structure. It contains a natural product known as digoxygenin, and that's what we're going to be mainly focusing on here. And it's biennial, so just a little side note, if you ever feel like planting it, it will last two years, and then you got to replant it. So foxglove medical uses. So digoxin is a cardiac glycoside. Uh, it's actually used quite frequently in uh, the medical field uh, to treat a variety of uh, various ailments, uh, all pertaining to the heart. Uh, going back uh, to the 18, to was it? I think I believe it was 1930 when they actually first extracting the natural product. Uh, it was believed to treat dropsy, which at the time was just edema in general. Uh, but the reason why is because it was for congestive heart failure, and that's what they found this to be more most useful for. Uh, it's also a steroidal compound. So one of the issues that we'll get into more later, uh, along with the heart issues, is also it being drastically uh, impairing on the kidneys. Here's just a little graphic. I'm not going to go too much in depth on it. I pretty much put this in, so if you ever want to refer back to this, this is going to have everything you need to know in it. Uh, so it disrupts the sodium and calcium uh, channels in the, in the uh, body, uh, and it drastically reduces heart rate. Uh, that's why one of the issues uh, when dealing with phosphate poisoning is also rapid body temperature loss. Uh, so we'll get more into treatment in a sec. OK, so prevention. One of the most common ways that owners will report uh, foxglove poisoning is typically on walks, as foxgloves uh, can uh, pretty much grow anywhere. They can grow in high sunlight and they can grow in shade. So if you're going on a forest path, you'll run into it. If you're walking on the street, it's very possible somebody plant it. It can grow anywhere. Uh, and one of the things about foxgloves is the toxin is found pervasively throughout the plant. It doesn't matter if you eat a flower or you eat some of the, some of the leaves in it, it you're going to get the poison, you're going to ingest it somehow. Uh, there, I'll get more into prevention in one second, uh, but I just want to know a little thing. One of, the, uh, one of the most noble cases of phosphate poisoning uh, were two individuals that made a herbal tea out of it, believing it was a different plant. Uh, so those symptoms took about a day to present itself. And then after that, they'd be put into a medically induced coma to treat it. Wow. Phosphate poisoning is very serious. Mm -hmm. it, there are some cures to it, but this is something that, to keep it simple, if your dog gets this poison, there's not that great a chance of them making it. So one of the first things you have to do in this scenario is remove foxgloves from your garden. Personally at home, I have dogs. I grow foxgloves. I can handle them, I know how it is, I know how to keep them off, I keep them in my garden, I wash my hands when I'm around them, and I change clothes, take a shower directly after. Uh, and when you're walking areas near foxgloves, make sure to give your animal a bath. So if you see the plant around there and your dog is brushing up against them, you need to clean them off because dogs are going to groom themselves and for that exact reason, they can get in because it does not require that much for them to get the toxic levels. Uh, so like I said, while, while your dog may not actually eat the plant, uh, most dogs aren't that silly, if you will. Uh, it's very possible that they can just get it from grooming. So first aid. So I wrote here, do not induce vomiting. I couldn't get a clear reason as to why, but every poison control website I could find says you don't want to induce vomiting, which is a bit strange because you only don't want to induce vomiting when something's like kerosene or corrosive. These ones coming back up, you can damage the esophagus. Uh, but for some reason, this case was different. So just to play it safe, don't induce vomiting. Uh, the symptoms, dizziness, severe uh, lethargy, vomiting, diarrhea, polydipsia, and weakness. Uh, you want to go to an emergency vet clinic. A regular vet clinic is most likely not going to be staffed and ready to handle this because this is going to be an all-hands-on-deck type issue. Uh, so go to an emergency hospital. Uh, 
uh, and you want to remove leftover particles from the dog's mouth, so you're going to have to get a little dirty, you're going to have to reach into the mouth and try and get out as much as possible because everything's going to be completely dose-based on the, how bad this issue is going to be. So treatment. There is no cure, like I said. If your dog gets this, everything's going to be maintenance-based thing. It's trying to, it's going to be supportive care. Uh, so your dog is most likely going to be dancing on death the whole time. Uh, so here's a general list of what would be done. Uh, all this information was ascertained from one of my friends and coworkers uh, at the emergency clinic uh, where I'm from, where what they would do if they had a toxicity case like this. So CBC, chem panel, oh excuse me, I'm spelling error, uh, and PCV, you want to get a broad baseline to see what's going on, how it's actually affecting everything. Uh, a UA for kidney function, as I said, it's a very strong steroid. You want to see how that's doing. Uh, the dog should be put on EKG and ECG at all times, as this is a heart rate uh, issue, you, the heart's going to be your main focus, uh, and then you're going to want to do an ultrasound to see cardiac function. Uh, so here I have a video on a gastric lavage. Uh, who here has worked at a vet clinic and has done a gastric lavage before? Anyone? Okay, great. We can launch this. You got a visual. How much sound do you need? Uh, you really don't need much. Okay. This is a okay. minute long video. Okay. But. Let me see. I don't want this to explode. Now, this is a procedure that is necessary in a poison patient or in patients with gastric dilatation volvulus or GDV. So, every veterinarian needs to feel comfortable performing this procedure. In general, we recommend doing this under general anesthesia so you can intubate your patient and inflate the endotracheal tube to minimize the risk of aspiration pneumonia. By placing an oral gastric tube into the stomach, we can perform multiple garage cycles, typically 10 to 15, to flush in warm water with a drenching pump in order to deliver the fluid. By doing this, we can help evacuate the stomach contents and administer activated charcoal. So again, a life-saving procedure that every veterinarian needs to feel comfortable performing. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, those you get sick of doing in an emergency clinic, but yeah. Uh, and like I said, it should be placed on a heating pad during all of this. Uh, as she said in the video, one of the things, oh, another video in the background. Hate all play. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, uh, so I was saying, uh, you need to be put on a heating pad because there's gonna be rapid body temperature drop uh, and that could cause further complications. Uh, and you want maintenance IV fluids to correct the in electrolyte imbalance, uh, occasionally two times maintenance, because like I said, of how severe this is. Uh, so in humans, there's a rare anecdote. I don't even know if you necessarily find this at just any hospital. You probably have to go to the CDC or something. But there is, a, uh, there is an anecdote called digibind, which stops uh, all uh, digoxin throughout the body that's not already been activated. Uh, so technically, yes, there is a cure. It's not tested on dogs. It's just so rare. It's not going to be something that you're going to like do right away. But it is interesting to note that it exists. Okay, and here's the sources. This is my friend Brianna. She's the one I've worked for uh, and been friends with for many years. And she taught me everything I need to know, at least in terms of poison damage. Now, is that her dog there? That is not her dog. That's who I've, that dog has since passed, but it was a good, good friend. Was it the clinic dog? Uh, not the oh, clinic dog, okay. no. Just okay. a favorite patient. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's give. Ethan, a round of applause. <laughs> Questions, comments? There's, I'll let you point out. Yep. Unless you mentioned it and I missed it, do you know like how much is uh, much toxic dose toxic. you're asking? Yeah. I do have it. Let me pull it up. If I believe correctly, it was two nanograms per mil of blood. Let me see if I put it in. Oh, yeah. So yeah, it's here. Okay. Two nanograms per milliliter of blood. That's not much. That's very much not much. That means like about, say you're dealing with what, like a chihuahua, they eat like three leaves. That's already a really high dosage. Okay. Okay. So you said you're dealing mainly with the like purple variety, like is there any difference? So there are other digitalis, there's some you'll find in like Madagascar, it's a pretty large genus. Uh, however, the one that we're concerned with, digitalis papilla, uh, those are all the various colors it comes in. It's just when it was first discovered, uh, the only one that was found was the purple variety, then they did genetic testing, and these are all functionally the same thing. It's just the purple is the most dominant of them. Uh, it's a pretty plant. Oh, no, it's a beautiful yeah, plant. That's, that's why I grow in my garden. No, it's yeah. beautiful. Uh, but I see the bees would love that, wouldn't they? I mean, bees? 
Oh yeah, look at all the spots. These and the ads. And the ads. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Comments, questions? Okay. okay. Thank you. And I did read my email while he was up there. Riley is ill, so we'll do Tatum next. And then we'll have time for sign up. Because we have two presentations, not three. So see, I'm trying to promote sign up a card because we'll have to have get our spots filled. Okay, I'll let you find your stuff there and I will get my thing ready. So great.